Hello, welcome to week four of history 1112. For today, we have not one, but two lectures. So there's going to be a lecture in lesson four folder and in lesson five folder. So make sure that you watch both of them this week. It's really important. For lecture four, we're going to talk about colonialism and how it kind of developed in the Americas. This is a continuation in some ways of the, the very first lecture I did. So let's kind of get into this real quick. Um, Got to talk about the conquest of Mexico. Uh, you may or may not know the story of it, but in case you don't, I'm going to you know just real quickly run through it here. And um, it's a really interesting story. In 1518, Hernan Cortez is going to invade Mexico with about 500 Spanish men. And what's really interesting about this, uh, he wasn't supposed to do it. He was under orders to establish trading posts by the Spanish government, but instead he is going to decide to take on the Aztecs. He is going to go off script, if you will, and, and make his own destiny. Now, who was Cortez? Um, he, his dad was a nobleman. He was chosen by his parents for a career in law. He knew Latin, but he never got a degree. And he ends up working for the government in Cuba. And he gets rich there. Well, in 1518, the Cuban governor sends him to the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico. And that's how he gets there. Well, what happens is at the city of Tabasco, he's going to meet an Aztec force in 1518 when he when he goes there. And remember, he's supposed to be setting up trade routes. He's not supposed to be conquering anybody. Well, Cortez, he doesn't bother with the trading posts. He knows about the Aztec Empire. He's heard of their silver. He's heard of their gold. And Cortez is going to, like I said, attack an Aztec force at the city of Tabasco. Uh, he wins, even though he's only got about 500 men, he wins against a much larger force because he's got steel weapons, he has steel armor. Uh, as you saw in the previous lecture, the Aztecs are using obsidian, which is a type of glass or a type of stone, if you will. As a result of this victory, uh, he's given several native prisoners, one of which is a woman named Malinch. Uh, she is Aztec. Her mother had sold her into slavery to the to the Tabascans. And when Cortez is given her, it turns out she can pick up language very well. She learns Spanish and then begins teaching Cortez about Aztec. Aztec culture, Aztec language, and what she knew about it. Well, eventually, Cortez is going to find a group of people called the Tlaxicans. And the Tlaxicans, they are not very friendly with the Aztecs. The Aztecs had beaten them a couple of times in war. And so the Tlaxicans or Tlaxicans decide to ally with Cortez so they can get back at the Aztecs. Now Cortez is going to be led to the city of Tenochtitlan. Cortez and Montezuma are going to meet. And when Cortez and Montezuma meet, they treat each other as friends. Well, in reality, Cortez has a completely different thing he's going to do. A couple of days after Cortez meets Montezuma, a religious ceremony is going to break out, or a planned religious ceremony is going to happen, and Montezuma is going to order the Spanish to surround the Aztecs without realizing it, going to order a massacre on the Aztecs 
And interestingly enough, the first people who are killed are the musicians because they're the ones who could sound danger. Well, the Aztecs will eventually fight the Spanish along with the Tlaxcalans or Tlaxicans. And in 1521, Cortez wins. And then by 1525, the Spanish kill the last Aztec emperor and the Aztec empire ceases to exist completely. We also have to talk about the conquest of Peru. This is going to be the Inca Empire. Uh, Francisco Pizarro is going to set up shop in what would be today Panama. He hears stories of these rich silver mines to the south, and he leads an expedition into Peru. When he gets to Peru with about 200 Spaniards, he's going to find the Inca in the middle of a civil war. The, the previous emperor has been killed off by smallpox. Two brothers are fighting for the throne. There's one named Atahualpa and the other one named Oscar. Well, Atahualpa is going to be captured by Pizarro, which completely freaks out the empire. They don't know what to do. Atahualpa is going to beg for his life. He's going to promise Pizarro gold and silver and he has the Aztecs bring an entire room full of gold and silver to Pizarro. Unfortunately for Atahualpa, it's not enough. And Pizarro has Atahualpa executed on July 26, 1533. Now that drives the Inca into an even bigger panic. Uh, there is chaos. The government falls apart. And Pizarro is going to march on the city of Cusco, invade it, conquer it, and the Inca Empire falls in like a year. The downfall of the Inca is just exponentially fast. Now you may have the question, why were they successful? And there's really four reasons I can give you. Number one, both Cortez and Pizarro went straight to the top. They took out the top guys and they created chaos. They also made allies. Cortez makes allies with an enemy of the Aztecs. Pizarro makes an ally with the other brother, Oscar. There's also European diseases. Smallpox, influenza, things like that are going to have a big impact. It's going to lessen the number of natives. Uh, estimates are smallpox had like a 90% death rate. It was pretty, it was hard to believe how many native people were dying. And as I mentioned with Cortez, there's superior weapons, superior armor. The Aztecs and the Inca and others like them just cannot compete. These European powers are going to establish colonies. If you have had US history, you're pretty familiar with the American colonies, so I'm not gonna go into them in detail for this class. I have an entire semester on that if you would like to take it in the summer or maybe next fall. So I'm just gonna kind of give you the basics here. The Spanish particularly, but also Portugal, France, even England, in some cases, they're going to set up this European style bureaucracy. There's going to be a governor, there's going to be mayors, there's going to be this whole bureaucratic system that develops. Uh, but eventually that's going to fall apart because there are wars in Europe that have to be paid for, especially with Habsburg Spain. Uh, before you know it, the governments are having to sell positions to make money to support the king of Spain. Uh, the Habsburgs actually declared bankruptcy like three or four times before their dynasty fell apart. Uh, so these government positions are going to be sold to American-born people of Spanish descent that are known as Creoles. 
And eventually it just becomes this idea of money over competency. Uh, whoever could pay the biggest price, regardless of how good or how bad they were to govern, are the ones who get control. Now, North American colonies are going to start a little bit later. Those are going to be your French colonies, your English colonies, even the Dutch get involved in settling North America. Uh, New York was originally New Amsterdam. Now, these North American colonies, they're going to be driven not just by profits, but also religious freedom. That's why you have places like Plymouth and the Puritans, or better known as the Pilgrims. Now, whether it's North America, Central America, South America, there's going to be this love-hate relationship with indigenous people. Another uh, one of the readings for this week is called The Destruction of the Indies. Uh, it's an eye-opening reading about what happens to the natives of the Caribbean when the Spanish get a hold of them. Uh, but uh, initially, especially in North America, the natives, they initially help European settlers, but it's very quickly going to turn into a competition and eventually resistance against European settlers. So this love-hate relationship goes south, so to speak, really fast. The last big thing for this lecture is the Columbian Exchange. And uh, there is a definition here. It's the transfer, both intentional and unintentional, of biological materials between Europe and the Americas. And I've got a picture here that kind of gives you an idea of what is being traded. <clears throat> a big one is food, uh, the potato. You've probably had a potato-based product in the past 24 hours. That was originally from South America, and it became the biggest crop in both Germany and Ireland. Corn, which was from Central America. Corn runs the world. There's corn in our gasoline. There's corn in our, our petroleum products. There's corn in our plastic. Um, corn syrup, sweeteners made out of corn, you name it. Corn is not just important because of all the different uses. Corn is very efficient at feeding people, and it became the primary food source for people in Europe. <clears throat> Even the tomato is from the New World. If you're a fan of pizza or if you like Italian food, uh, that's a staple in Italy now, but it was originally a new world crop. In fact, the Italian word for tomato is pomodoro, which means golden apple. Why was it called a golden apple? Number one, it was gold. And number two, the, the closest thing to a tomato that existed in Europe was an apple. Sugar is a big one. Uh, I'll talk about that a little bit more in the next lecture. But uh, sugar becomes the biggest cash crop of the early exchange period. Um, originally, honey was the sweetener, but right around 1500, maybe 1600, the amount of honey being produced goes down. And so sugar becomes the main sweetener of Europe. You also have drinks, coffee, and tea. While originally coffee and tea were from the Middle East and Asia, they were brought to the Americas, specifically South and Central America, where it was discovered that tea and coffee grow very well. So you have tea plantations, coffee plantations set up, and then all of that is going to be sent back to Europe. Chocolate even. Uh, you may not think of chocolate as a drink, but that's how it started. Chocolate is going to be found in Central America, and it's brought back to Europe in the form of cacao. And um, cooking techniques, if you're a fan of barbecue. Barbecue is known as barbacoa, and barbacoa came from the word boucan, and that was a cooking style that was used in the Caribbean islands. Now, to stuff that's a little less pleasant, disease. 
Uh, diseases from Europe struck native populations very hard because they had no immunity to these diseases. Uh, measles, smallpox, mumps, pneumonia, all of those were European diseases that were brought to the New World. And native populations had like a 90% mortality rate from these diseases. Uh, estimates are before European contact, the Americas, North and South America together, had about 30 million people. That's equivalent to what Europe had at the time. But by 1650, that's roughly 150 years after Columbus came, that 30 million people was under 5 million. So disease took a big, big toll. Last but not least, people. People are going to be sent from Africa to North America. And that gives me a perfect segue into the next video. So once again, there are two videos this week. This is video one. This is lesson four. And then the lesson five video will be in the lesson five folder. So I'll be back with you in a couple of minutes for your next lecture.